Hello everybody, uh, welcome to Mac's minifigure mashup. I am Mac and today I will be teaching you guys how to take normal plastic fantasy miniatures like these, or really any miniatures, and turn them into something, well, a bit more unique according to whatever you want it to be. So, a little rundown on me. Uh, I have been doing this, I've been making models pretty much my entire life, but I've only really gotten serious into it for about a year now. Um, primarily what I do is I do uh, a variety of, of tabletop games, my favorite being Warhammer 40k, but there are some other tabletop games that I really enjoy playing. Um, uh, Warhammer's Age of Sigmar, which is a fantasy version of 40k, I enjoy that. I enjoy Dungeons and Dragons, and really I enjoy fantasy and monsters and all that in general, so it's kind of a big reason of, of why I started to make my own miniatures. Now, when I got them, I thought, well, these are great and all, but I have some ideas for characters that I want to do. So I learned a bit about multi-part kits, which are what these are, and I learned especially that you can take bits and pieces, so stuff like this, helmets, arms, shields, swords, spears, anything really from any given kit, capes even, from any given kit, I could take them and combine them into a pretty interesting looking miniature. For example, this went from a normal knight on horseback into a four-armed skeletal archer slash knight. So it's pretty, it's pretty fun that just with a few simple pieces of plastic you can transform your miniatures from something that was generic and you know would stand out if it had a great paint job into something that's completely unique to you and you alone. So going through the stuff today that I'm going to be using, uh, these figures primarily come from a game called Rune Wars. It's a pretty cool game. It's, uh, it's pretty cheap for how many uh, figures you get inside of it and the potential for Kit bashing figures uh, with parts from this kit is incredible. You're basically it gives you a set of elves and a set of skeletons, and you get everything from mounted cavalry, like I showed you previously, to archers to there's even a, I, I believe a, a rogue type character. So these could be used for anything for you know if you do play war games like I do, it could be used as uh, you know a generic stand-in army for um, what I'm going to transform mine in today is I'm going to do a. Uh, uh, an army of skeletons slash undead led by some uh, some noble vampires is what I'm going for. Um, but you can turn it into anything you like. If you like high elves like Legolas from Lord of the Rings or some of the races from uh, World of Warcraft, you could do that. Um, it's got a really interesting uh, rock golem figure. So four-armed rock golem is it's really, really cool. So um, these make for great encounter pieces if you're doing... Dungeons and Dragons, it makes for great player character minis if you're doing, um, if you require a specific miniature. Uh, but today I will be doing uh, <laughs> Undead Skeleton slash Elf slash Vampire Army. Um, in addition to this, I will be using one of my favorite companies slash favorite models from said company, uh, Maggot Crown Ogre Juggernaut. And basically what it is, is it's a really, really nice. Uh, really, really nice, well sculpted piece for usually for Dungeons and Dragons, but it's a uh, of essentially a put the head in here, uh, an undead ogre in plate armor, which is going to be really cool potential for conversions, and I feel would fit in very, very well with uh, with my undead army here. I'm going for uh, to give you the pit. The the pieces we're going to be using today are called bits. Now I came around bits and, and kit bashing in general from, uh, like I said before, the multi-part kits. Now, when you get to where I am, I have what's called, I have a bits box. So, built up over various kits of, in, of uh, different ones that I bought over the years, or in some rare cases, I've been able to actually buy just boxes of random bits outright. I've managed to come up with collections of various uh, chess pieces. My favorites are helmets, because the heads are always one of the more unique aspects of giving a a solid character, a good profile, to various bits and bobs to add to the depth of a character. For example, like these little pouches here. Um, and in this kit, I have a, a combination of 3D printed stuff, uh, resin, 
and uh, plastic. But you can get everything from... You can get those. Uh, sometimes you'll even get them where they're old enough, you'll actually get metal pieces. So these usually aren't in production as much anymore. I know Reaper actually has a really nice line of metal minifigures. For example, this is their Chaos Lord in armor. And it's metal. It's, it's very weighty. It's one of my favorite figures. So uh, I've collected these bits. I've 3D printed some of them myself. Um, and then there's some bits that if you want to keep, like if you have, it, for example, in this kit, if I wanted to have extras of this helmet, there's plenty of them in there. But if I didn't want to use all of them from this kit, you can take very easily uh, a two-part putty and make molds. So that's for backpacks. That's for a, a, a foot for a piece of heavy machinery. Uh, uh, an underslung uh, rifle for one of my uh, Space Marine characters from 40K, and uh, here's some swords and a, uh, um, I believe that's called a, it's it's a it's an armor. It's uh, Rondel is what they're called. Um, it's a tiny shield that goes in between the shoulder guard and the breastplate to protect the shoulder joint. So now that we have a little bit of history lesson about kit bashing and all the types of fun stuff you can do with it. Uh, tools we're going to need today. Most importantly, <laughs> glue. Uh, I'm using a super glue today. Um, usually, this is a very good start. This is how I got into most of my model kits. Usually what I'll do is I'll use this for anything from plastic to resin. Um, but once you get a little bit more advanced, you can get into some stuff like this, which is... Uh, it's essentially uh, not so much glue as it is a solvent. It basically dissolves the plastic in such a way that it creates a stronger chemical bond. or a, a, It basically melts it together. But for today, we'll be using the Instacure uh, glue. And any of this glue is fine, so long as it's not the foaming kind, because if you use the foaming kind on these miniatures, you are going to get some very, very, very ugly-looking plague abominations, which, hey, that might be what you're going for. And if so... I mean, it's always fun to experiment with, with your with your work, but not today. <laughs> uh, secondly, second most important tool, X-Acto knife. Um, this is a specialty one. You can put your finger through it. I very rarely do that. I just like how small it is in my hand. Um, but any X-Acto knife or razor knife, or they're, they're called hobby knives in some places, this will work. Um, I like having a sharp blade on mine. It's very handy for carving down plastic. It's it's very handy for making very clean cuts. Um, and in comparison to a different tool, um, which is these, these are uh, these are nippers in my case, but they should be called cuticle cutters in the list that is, accompanies this video. Um, whatever it is, as long as it is a pliers or cutters in a plier format, it should work just fine. But this is for larger cuts for that requires a lot of effort to cut through. So if I was cutting through like, for example, the, 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 the shaft of this weapon or even a peg like this to make a different pose, I would use these for it because this would take a lot of effort and you could run the risk of either shifting the cut and cutting yourself or, or breaking the blade, which is unfavorable to do. Um, another super handy tool to have, emery boards. So these are just your basic run-of-the-mill emery boards, uh, nail files, whatever you whatever, they go add a bunch of different names. They're super handy to have around, um, especially with plastics like this. If you make a cut, or and it's kind of rough, or you've got some some leftover material that you want to get rid of, but you don't want to have to spend time carving it down with the X-Acto, this is very good to get rid of that. It's also very good at getting rid of the mold lines that are present on the actual figures themselves. So if I pick up... It's a really good example. All right. Yeah, so if you look really closely, you can see along this edge here. Uh, I've gone ahead and removed some of this. This is why it's harder to see. But there's a line that runs here, and it's a little extra lip of plastic. And basically, that's where the plastic was injection molded and seeped out a little bit. So you don't have to do it, but it's general practice to make your models look extremely nice if you do that. If you just take them and you can either shave them down with an X-Acto knife like I, I do, or you can uh, just as easily take this and sand the surface down to make it a bit more smooth. Uh, sanding twigs, available at most hobby stores. Pretty cheap, very good for getting uh, into small areas. So if I wanted to sand the inside of this axe, it's very easy to get in there. 
Um, it's also because it is a, a, a twig, it's got some sponge in there, so that means if you're sanding a rounded surface, it won't create a flat spot. It'll go with the curvature of the actual uh, uh, curved surface, so it will make the blending of uh, surfaces very, very nice. Uh, last thing we should be using today is epoxy sculpt. Um, this is a two-part epoxy. Uh, it's a it's a, a putty usually used for plumbing repairs and and automotive, but uh, it has a variety of different uses outside of that, and it's especially handy in the model making community. Um, as just by mixing up some of this, you can essentially sculpt on and create entire uh, additions of of new and a, new and incredible looking add-ons to your pieces that you know you wouldn't normally get out of a out of a bits kit you basically you can sculpt whatever you want um here's an example of mine uh i wanted to him to have a i went with a, a highlander theme so scotland uh the, the scottish highlanders were a big part of my inspiration for this so i gave him a fur collar and added a uh some furs to the side of this of this hunting bike that he has and then added here it looks a little bit like swaths of, of tartan that had been gathered around his his chest and waist. And once those are done, they once they're painted, it will look like bound cloth wrapped around his chest and his sides. Um, today I'll be using this Gorilla Epoxy Putty. Uh, usually I use Milliput. Um, it's a little bit more expensive, but it is really, really good. Uh, it's kind of a common place. The other common uh, epoxy putty that you'll find is green stuff. Um, both of these are water soluble. So that means you can get uh, a little bit of water and wipe it down and essentially smooth out the surface as you would like a normal clay. But once it once it dries, it'll dry even underwater. So once it dries, it'll, it'll be solid and you'll get essentially a really, really stiff brick or in this case, plank of uh, epoxy putty. So, with that done, with that out of the way, uh, I'm going to take you guys through some uh, different tips and tricks and just generally just the stuff that I, that how I go about making mine uh, kit bash miniatures uh, and how uh, you could do similar if you wanted to. Now, if you have the Rune Wars box set, you can follow along with me. I would recommend, if you want to try that out, go for it. Uh, I always like creating stuff that's my own, so if I do something that you don't like, please feel free to change it. Uh, your own; These are your miniatures. <laughs> you, you, you paid money for them, so you can do with them as you want. Uh, this is just the direction I chose to take them in. So, uh, I've done a few examples here. So, he, this I keep showing you this guy. Uh, he's one of my favorite. Uh, it's just a weird hybrid of, of two bodies in one. Um, and essentially what I did was I took the hero figure that comes with the skeleton army. I took one of his arms that I used for a different conversion, which I'll show you in a bit, left a big gap on the side of his body. So I took a spare skeleton torso and trimmed it down a bit and adhered it to the side of it with some super glue. Uh, I put the normal arm that came with this body originally on there. Um, a different, I took the head off of one of the elven cavalry and the other axe from his other hand and put it in the shield and basically made this horrible skeleton, half undead, uh, soldier character, which I think is rather cool. Uh, another conversion I did, this one's very simple. All I did was a simple head swap. So this, this used to be a skeleton head, uh, I took that off, and I took the head off of one of the elven foot soldiers, put it on there, and it created a, a sense of like a ramshackle, almost like Skyrim, Skyrim Dragor or uh, White Walker from Game of Thrones-esque character of uh, a not so emaciated head and body, but with skeletal limbs, as if um, the the processes of of decay had already taken in in his extremities, rather than just his body. Uh, very very simple, but changes the aesthetic of the actual miniature itself and turns it into more of a undead rather than just a skeleton. Um, next one, this is one of the bigger ones. 
uh, I took the skeleton riding a purple worm and I made him the, the warlord character. Uh, I figured that this was a, a good way to kind of denote rank. Um, usually a visual hierarchy is the bigger the character is, usually the more important or more like destruction that it has. So I figured that would be a good start, is to make my warlord. So this was the first one I did. Um, took the arm off of the main skeletal commander, put it on the side of a cavalry body, which I had gotten from one of the uh, elven cavalry. Um, I cut the sword and shield arms off just at the shoulder plates, um, and then I attached the previous rider, the skeletal javelin, uh, onto the, the stump of where the old arm used to be, and I attached the head to the top. Uh, and I actually used the cavalry head right here as almost a, a trophy on the side of his saddle. So that, that's kind of the... Kind of, hopefully these, these demonstrations will give you a, in a, kind of what I'm going for with how I want this army to feel. Uh, I wanted to be able to make a cohesive unit. There's a couple more. Here's my forearmed uh, skeletal cavalryman again. Um, I really like the idea of having uh, both close quarters and long range weapons all in one soldier, especially forearms being such a unique uh, profile for a character. It's very makes a very visually interesting character. And then uh, just a simple skeletal archer on horseback. Um, now that we, now that I have my test models out of the way, my two horsemen uh, and two warriors and a warlord, I'm going to move on to actually showing you how I did it. So, what you want to do is, um, I usually go through and I, I just look at each of the figures that come in the box. I take apart, you know, the kit. I look through the pieces, and sometimes it, it just... Sometimes people will say, you need to be organized with how you do things. You need to be, you need to be, you know, divide everything up into parts and, and do all that. So, I mean, if that's how you work, great. Uh, sometimes I, I find that if you just have all the pieces in front of you, it may get jumbled. It may look messy. But I feel like when you see everything together, it's very, it's much easier, at least for me, to look at pieces next to each other and go, ooh, that looks good, and give, get ideas from it. So I'm going to take my figures and I'm going to dump them everywhere and look through the parts and pieces until I find a body or arm or set of armor that I like or, or see just a combination of, of various elven slash undead pieces that I like and just go from there. Um, and then afterwards, I'll show you a little bit of work. I'm going to show you how to do the basic kit bash of just taking bits and pieces and gluing them together to make a unique character. And then I'll show you how to kit bash with uh, epoxy sculpt, which is adding on uh, additional sculpted elements to your designs. All right, so almost done. This this set is actually really nice. It comes with a lot of really really good. Natures. And these are 28 millimeter heroic scale, which is generally the scale of most D&D miniatures. They can be bigger, they can be smaller, but usually most tabletop games are 28 millimeter scale. So, looking through here, we've got some interesting pieces. I'm, I like the skeletons in this kit. I'm a, I'm a sucker for undead characters or, and just revenants and wraiths and, and stuff like that. Always took an interest in those. So, kind of liking the broken shield on this guy's on this guy's back and the the axe and dagger combo he's got going. So I might what I do what I might do is I might. Hmm. So see, this is a this is an important part of the process. If you have an idea in your head, that then then you can sort through these pieces and you can find exactly what you want. But I I like to go through it and come up with ideas as I you know, look at the pieces and, and start a visual storytelling. Because um, that's a that's a big part and often overlooked part of kit bashing, at least in my opinion, is sometimes you just overlook the simplest things. And, you know, having a story could could make you click with a character in such a way that you just it becomes less of a chore to do this and more of a of a oh man, this is actually really fun. So I've decided that I want to Rather than give 
the skeletal um, so this really upper cool body uh, upper torso character rather than do the generic skeleton with him which I'm gonna do on a few others uh, I want to switch out a elven sh uh, spearman uh, I'll switch out for his legs so what I'm gonna do now that I've made a mess shift all this to the side so you can see I'm gonna take my exacto knife and just above his, his his waist, above the belt, I'm gonna cut. Now, the reason I'm doing this with an X-Acto knife, even though it's kind of a hefty cut, is because I want it clean. When you cut with the pinchers, oh, also make sure not to keep your not to put your fingers in the way of the blade. Never do that. Um, I've got a fair amount of scars in my hands to tell you why that's a bad idea. Um, but make sure to hold your pieces, especially little ones, because if you cut them, usually the tension will send them flying off somewhere, and if you need that piece, it's kind of hard to get on your hands and knees to go look for it. Um, but the reason I'm using an X-Acto knife is because when you cut with the clippers, it pinches the material up, and it deforms the plastic slightly. And sometimes for a lot of plastics, that's not a bad thing, but if you're working with a delicate piece and it warps it out of place, it's a little, a little bit difficult to, to get it back into shape. So, alright, and that gives you a pretty clean cut. Um, test fit your pieces, kind of make sure that it's going to make him a little hunched, but I'm going with, I'm going with kind of a classic kind of fantasy skeleton look. Um, I know I didn't make it clear before, but uh, this, one of the most important tools, if not the most important tool, cutting mat. If you don't have one of these then I hope you have a table you're not fond of. Because <laughs> you're going to end up cutting everything that you're cutting on top of to bits if you don't appropriately cover and protect it. So this is a, this is a pretty easy... You can get cutting mats at various craft stores. Uh, they're not super hard to come by. Um, I like a bigger one just because it gives you more surface space. If not, you can just use a, a piece of cardboard, honestly. That's what I started off on backs of sketchbooks, whatever you have on hand, just as long as it doesn't cut the table, because uh, I know I've had my hide tanned from by my mom and dad about, you know, you cut on our table! So, uh, reminiscing about my childhood uh, trauma, <laughs> uh, no longer. I am going to... See, as a clean cut, so I'm not going to have to um, sand it, but I, I'm just going to go ahead and put a little bit of glue. Uh, and with super glue, it spreads pretty evenly, so sometimes you have to put a lot on. I tend to say less is more in the case of super glue, just because I'd rather have to put a little bit more on rather than you know on a later stage than have it spilling over. And because when you paint it, it's gonna look, it's gonna show up, and the, your glue lines are gonna be fairly obvious. So this piece requires a bit more glue. That's why I pick on dead factions, is because uh, if you do that, then it doesn't matter how shoddy your craftsmanship is, you can go, it's just decay. It's just rot. I promise. I, it was fully intentional. Alright, so, even though I, all I did was just cut off a torso and put it on another one, I've created a kind of interesting looking character. He's squat, he's angry, and he's more up-armored than his other skeletons. Maybe he was a uh, angry yet somewhat well-off brawler in his previous life who had a, a stint of, of, of scoliosis, maybe? It kind of compressed him down? Maybe he was just a very angry hunchback. You never know. Um, but coming up with fun characters like that, is that that's a, that's my one of my favorite parts about this because no longer is it just, oh, here is skeleton warrior number one and skeleton warrior number two now it's here's bob and here's bob's backstory or here's skeletor the great no relation to skeletor from he-man um <laughs> it, it just it's just fun you end up talking to your miniatures a lot and then your your friends or parents come up and they go who are you talking to and you say oh, oh nobody just my plastic toys and they look at you weird and make weird judgment on your character and sanity and kind of funny if you think about it. I am being 
100% sarcastic. I don't talk to my miniatures. They talk to me. <laughs> uh, all right, so now that we have Bob here, right? I'm going to set Bob down for now. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, wait, wait, I don't know if Bob... Does he look like a Bob to you? Mysterious cameraman? Okay. Uh, I'm going to set Bob here for now. And if I have another idea for Bob, I'll come back to Bob. You can make his friend leave. Yes. That's, that's a great combination for skeleton name. Uh, let it be noted that uh, the lovely woman behind the camera uh, just came up with his friend should be named Weave, so we have Bob and Weave. Um, I feel like if we have Bob and Weave, one of them needs to be headless as a result because I think Bob should uh, I think Bob should have his head. I think I might leave Weave headless just because, you know, it's twice as funny because a Weave can also refer to a haircut. That's kind of funny. And maybe Weave wasn't so lucky. Maybe he needed to bob when he was supposed to bob, but he weaved instead. <sighs> I'm glad I am semi by myself here. I would seem like a real strange person if I was... Oh! Oh, hello! Uh... <laughs> you are a strange person. Yeah, I know. I own it, though. All right. Um, sometimes, it, sometimes you just got to look. You gotta stare into the abyss so that the abyss can whisper, "Hey, you should do this." Um, and that abyss right now is gray plastic, so I'm looking through it and just picking through the various parts until I find a piece that I really get inspired by. So we already know the premise of what Weave's gonna be, right? So Weave is going to be a presumable undead character that in some capacity has lost his head and we're gonna I'm gonna show you a good way to execute that so that it doesn't look like oh you just forgot to put your head on although that's perfectly acceptable too so I have this leftover skeleton body I might or, let's see all right here's that body I cut off previously let's see how this fits against this I'd say that's pretty good pretty good so do I want to cut weaves head off now or do I want to wait oh I've got a very sick okay this this is it's your miniatures right so you can be kind of kind of weird if you want to I think as as gross as this is gonna be I think it would be absolutely hilarious in in my own sick opinion we're not going to cut all the way through Weave's head here. Oh, nearly headless Nick. Yes, almost headless Weave. No, <laughs> no, no, no association. We have, we have, we have Skeletor, not Skeletor, no association to Skeletor from He-Man. And we have nearly headless Nick, no association to nearly headless Nick of the Harry Potter franchise. So we're going to glue that here. Oh, even I, I just had an even better idea. Should we leave him nearly headless or should we just turn his head backwards? I think we should turn his head back. That's that's a funnier thing. Cause see, it doesn't always have to make sense. That's another reason fantasy and undead fantasy is such a great thing, because your characters don't have to make sense. Why why do you ask if why I cast fireball in an enclosed space? I don't have to answer that. I just cast fireball. That's the way these things work. So sometimes you'll fit a piece down and you I you won't like the way it looks. I didn't like the way that was fitting, so I'm going to take it and very carefully here. Note the very carefully part. I'm going to trim down the neck and a little bit of the front and the chin and the back of the helmet just a bit to make it his head, although backwards, sit a bit more naturally on the on the 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 makeshift torso we have going for him okay yeah this is gonna turn out really fun i kind of wanted a serious tone to this but you know what there, there was there were those two pirates i forget their names remember what the pirates were called those those two that were like always a side plot and all the pirates of the caribbean movies that were all the undead crew mm -hmm. like the one with the wooden eye I know you're here, yeah that one and he's like uh I've been reading, and he goes, what do you mean you've been reading? You're illiterate. It's really funny. All right. So, now that we have 
Weave's head, uh, Weave's head is backwards now, which is is pretty great. I think if I'm going to paint this character, I'm going to make it look like he has angry eyes painted on the back of his helmet. Um, I would do it in Sharpie, but I, I know that's going to come back and bite me if I do that, so I'm not going to do that now. So just imagine, little angry eyes on the back of the helmet. Um, to make a pun joke, at least nobody will try to attack him from behind, because he'll be looking them in the eye if they try. Uh, Alright, so now I'm going to take one of the uh, elven spearman arms, the shields, and fit it, hopefully, fit it into, there, the arm socket of this torso. Uh, it should fit pretty nicely, because it's the torso that it came from, or that it goes with, I should say. So, generally on these miniatures, you don't have to, especially for this, I'm not so concerned with how the join looks. So, but if this was a, a, a seam, very obvious seam, I would do a lot of work to trim it down and make it look like it blends in with the actual rest of the figure. In this case, it's, it's all right. Um, yeah, I think that's, I think that serves the purpose we want, purpose we wanted to. All right. Um, now I gotta think. Is is Weave more of a sword, spear, or axe user? Let's see. Or is he? No, he can't be a bow because he's got a shield. I think I think Weave is a sword user, if not an axe user. So I think he's. I'm gonna try and find a sword here. Here's a good sword. Although this, this this axe is very tempting. Nah, I'm sticking with the sword. See, every time you kit bash, it's really fun if you put all your bits in a pile like this, because then it becomes a scavenger hunt. And then you can tell when you're tired or when you need to stop, because instead of, you know, stopping when you cut yourself, you, you stop when you can't find the bit that's in your hand. Uh, I've done that before. <laughs> it's not fun. You feel very old in a very short time span. Now, we do always have the option of doing a very comically oversized weapon, but I will save that for a different character. Of course, also, if you get tired of looking, just find a just find another sword and just cut it off. Oh, but that's a left-handed sword. Okay. Oh, we could give Weave two shields. Oh, that would be hilariously ironic. Huh. I'll just give him a spear. Just for the sake of time. Alright. Put a little dab of glue in. And in goes the spear. So now we have Bob and Weave. Weave was not so lucky, which is ironic because he's the one who's supposed to be keeping them at a distance with his long arm. Uh, and Bob, close quarters, I guess he's gotten into more fights up close, so it makes sense that, you know, Weave is the one that got his head knocked about. So, we have our, the beginnings of our, of our force. We have Double Header, I'm gonna call him Double Header, no association to baseball, Skeleton Archer number one, Four Arms, Skeleton Lord, Skeleton Archer, Bob, and Weave. All right. Let's see. What 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 char what character should we do next? Uh, do the big one. Do big one. All right, time for big boy. All right. Which big boy? Okay, so we've got two options here for the big boy. We can get all the bits and pieces for the ogre, the maggot crown ogre juggernaut, which is a really cool name, if not slightly long. Um, honestly, I don't know if I want to do anything to this one. I thought about taking his secondary arms off and leaving him like that, and then using these on the ogre, but I don't know how well that fits. See, it's all about just testing and seeing. So I'll go ahead and assemble the ogre's bottom quarter. Go. 
If you, if you didn't see that, all I did was glue his tiny little legs in. These are, like, super short. Um, we're going to do some people like that. Um, and then I'm going to glue the soles of his feet to his base. Which is pretty cool, because a lot of these Reaper miniatures, um, sometimes you'll get them... And they'll come with a they'll come with a base, but generally the, the the general thing is they've got really really good detail. So not on the list, but one of my favorite figures is this is Scorg Fire Giant King. Really cool, really really cool, and it's like he's even got detail underneath his cape, which is just great. Um, I'm going to turn him into something in the future, but not in this video. So. We have our Ogre Juggernaut body done. And I, I was going to sculpt some stuff for the back, but I really like this back detail he's got with this layered armor. So I don't think I'm going to cover that up. Um, I, what I will do is I will show you guys how to get rid of mold lines with your Exacto. It's very simple. Just take the edge. You can, take, you can also do this with the back of the knife. I prefer using the edge just because it's a little bit faster. And just gently scrape. And be sure to kind of go moderately slow, just because you don't want to mess up the surface of your thing or accidentally go too fast and cut yourself in the model. And make sure to change angles with it. Change it's it's better to change the angle of the miniature rather than the angle of your hand. Because you can make the miniature go in really weird ways, but it's not safe to do a very awkward angle with uh, a sharp knife with moving your hand. It's not fun. I always find this is one of the more satisfying parts about building. Because you get to kind of fulfill your OCD and just trim everything up and make everything look uniform and nice and it's kind of satisfying to scrape off this stuff. Unless it's being annoying, and then it just makes you angry. Alright. I think that's good for the mold lines. So, now we've got to see. Do we want to put his normal ogre arms on there, or do we want to do something special? I don't want to, hmm, I have an idea to do a three-armed ogre, but I don't know how well that would work. Because then that would mean that, eh, okay, get his weapon arm glued in, I'll just put it in. Putting pieces in without gluing them in is something called dry fitting. And it's very good to help kind of check the look and the feel of the model to make sure that you're going in the right direction. So it's, it's perfectly fine to not glue things together just yet and just dry fit things just to get a, a feel for them. Um, because the last thing you want to do is put together a model and go, you know what, I don't actually like how that looks and then not be able to change it. So... Hmm. Trying to think. Should we let the rock golem keep his four arms, or should we give Mr. Ogre here some helping hands? Well, we'll see. Anybody want to know what the, uh, Maggot Crown Ogre looks like. All put together, that's what he looks like. Now, what we could do this is this is an equally cool thing. Let's see how would this look here? I think that could also work. Make him have a rock hand. That'd be kind of cool, yeah. 
So sometimes pieces aren't going to fit exactly how, like how you want them to fit. And you know what? That's okay. I can show you how to fix that with the milliput. But also, you don't even have to do that sometimes because, honestly, no one will see it unless they, they pick it up and, like, look like at a very specific angle. So, taking some executive action here, I am going to put this rock arm on... What's a good name for this guy? Shrek. Let's, no, it's too on the nose. Uh... It's a very ogre sounding name. Susan. Susan. Susan the ogre. There we go. Susan. Okay. Now Susan has an arm made of rock, which is going to be cool. So now I get to demonstrate how these clippers work. It's very, it's a very complicated process. All you got to do is just like that. It's super complicated. Don't feel bad if you don't get it on your first try. Uh, it took me uh, half a decade to learn how to just clip things. I wish I was joking. I'm just kidding. I'm totally joking. It only took me three years to learn. Uh, so, I, I'm cleaning up this cut this, with the clippers. Because generally, it, sometimes if you get a big enough piece, you won't have to worry about the deformities in the plastic. But you can see, if you look closely, there's a little bit of a dip in the plastic. And that's basically where it sheared off at a weird angle because the compression of the snippers between the, the, the pincers, let's see if I can show you. Um, watch the sides carefully because as you squeeze, it's going to contort and deform. It's going to spread apart because that's, what that's what's essentially happening until one side pops off. Um, and then you're left with... It's semi-flat in this area, but... Generally, it's semi-flat in this area, but generally it's going to deform your plastic, especially on small pieces. So, now that Susan has gained an arm, we trim this peg off of him. Don't worry about random pieces if you don't care about them. If you want to salvage them, I'd recommend holding on to them. Um, we're going to give... It's the opposite of Susan. Eduardo here, historically historically accurate. Eduardo is the direct opposite of Susan. Why I don't know. It's just the rules. We're gonna give Eduardo here a nice armored up hand, an arm really, armored up. Ha 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 ha! I'm up. I'm a pun lord, is what I am. It's like a meme lord, but worse. <laughs> Maybe that's what I should make. Maybe that that's what I'm calling him. All right. Uh, 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 uh. All in favor, say aye. Aye. It is passed. This is now the meme lord of my skeleton army. <sighs> so. Ske I guess Skeletor can be the meme lord, because there's been, like, tons of skeleton Skeletor memes. If you can't tell, I'm a bit... I'm a bit off the deep end. I guess you have to be if you're in a creative field. I guess all the chemicals I work with kind of fried my brain. Makes me see cool colors, though. Until my parents make me come out and get fresh air. That's always not fun, because I have to come back to reality. No, let me be with my miniatures. They talk to me. No, come outside. Maybe why I'm drawn to vampires is probably because like I don't ever go outside. I'm always inside building miniatures. I mean, not that you can go outside right now. I mean, you can. It's just, oh, go outside at, at, just at, at night and wander the woods. Like a normal sane person would do. <laughs> All right, so uh, I Susan here is going to keep their other arm. Um, maybe that's their thing. Maybe Maybe these two are friends, right? And they just decided, you know what? We're not just the type of friends that, like, always have, like, our cool secret handshake. Why don't we just give each other each other's arms so that we never forget our handshake? Or maybe Susan is still in control of Susan's arm, and Eduardo is still in control of Eduardo's arm, and they like to mess with each other. Like, when Susan is doing whatever dead ogres equate to sleep, uh, maybe Eduardo likes to slap slap them in the face. Or... Mm -hmm. Why are you, yeah, why are you hitting yourself? Why are you hitting yourself? Also known as 
a direct quote from my childhood for about nine years of my life with my brother. Stop hitting yourself, stop hitting yourself. And then we learned how to pick up sticks and then the game was game over. Another important thing about kit bashing is basing. But that's like an entirely different art. That's, that's getting close to finishing a model. So I'm not going to worry too much about that. Actually, with this kit, you get some really cool bases. Um, so this has got a, a hole in the middle. So let's pick... Uh, let's do Bob. Bob Bob needs to be exalted here. Um, Bob now has a pretty cool, sweet base. Uh, it's kind of barren, but it's got some skulls. Uh, that guy's actually not dead. He's just, you know, lost his body. Same with him. They're kind of a... Uh, they're a bit of lazy bones, you know? Actually, they were they were taken away from their bodies and put there because they kept making puns. Um, Skeletor doesn't like that. He's a meme lord. He wants memes, no puns. So, now, now you get some pretty cool bases. I use a variety of different stuff. I, I use a combination of... Uh, it's a very easy base to do. Is um, you, get a bit of, you get a bit of cork like this, right? And cork is very easy to break, break apart. And when you do, it makes some, actually some really interesting uh, rock textures. So you, what you do is you take this and you you glue it to the base like that, and then you take and you take like sand or dirt. You can take dirt from outside, um, but what you need to do to prepare that is put it in a baking pan, preferably not one that you cook on, unless you really want an earthy flavor. Um, Put it on a baking pan and bake it for 15 to 20 minutes. And basically that'll kill all the microbes in it. And you can use it as a ster sterile uh, basing material. And uh, cork, sand, and a little bit of like PVA glue. You can make some seriously, seriously awesome bases. Like this is a character called Angron. Primarch of the World Eaters for all the 40k nerds out there like me. Um... I made a pretty cool base based off his home world uh, with cork and EVA glue and sand and a lot of bases. Citadel, the company, or Games Workshop, the, game, the company that actually manufactures this game and these miniatures, makes a box of just nothing but skulls. And they've got everything from orc skulls to alien skulls to a whole thing of human skulls. And you got pristine human skulls and broken human skulls, which are kind of cool. So if you ever need a lot of skulls, Citadel is definitely a place to get them. We'll put Angron. No, Angron's on a skeleton. He doesn't belong there. All right. Okay. So I think that's that's for now at least. Eduardo is set. Yeah, Eduardo is set. He's he's good to go. Um, and I think Susan is also set. I'll just glue Susan's head in. Maybe we'll give Susan uh, an upgrade with Eduardo later, but for right now, I think that's sad. I mean, like, even the smallest little changes, that adds a whole lot more character to it. Because you see these two set up with each other. You think, wait a minute, they've got, they've got arms that match each other, but they're not on the same figure. What's the story there? You think, uh, well, you come up with a cool story. Maybe, maybe they, maybe... He, you know, Eduardo likes to hold hands with himself and just got weirded out doing it, you know, when he's with one of his other sets of arms. Or or maybe maybe they fought each other and they both simultaneously lost an arm. And instead of picking up their same arm because they're both blind, uh, maybe they picked up each other's arms. Or it was a show of respect. It's, it's coming up with the stories that makes your army interesting. Because if you've got a reason or you can explain it, Anything you do is totally like anything you make a miniature out of. Like, for example, Weave. Weave has a cool story. When someone asks, why is his head backwards? You don't have to say, just because. You can now say, well, his name's Weave. Got his head knocked around, so that's why. His best friend's Bob. You know, they're Bob and Weave. All right. That's enough rambling. For now, at least. Let's see. Got a fair amount of these guys. This I'm kinda I'm kinda wanting to make a 
Let's put it here. These elves are really not having a good day. I keep cutting their heads off. Hope if I held the clippers the right way. All right. Okay. Sometimes you'll, what you'll need to do is, and this is a technique I only do this because I'm very comfortable with the knife. If you feel like you're going to cut yourself, don't do this. But it's kind of like, the, you know, have you ever seen those movies where like the super cool guys cut an apple with a knife and they like always do this? Yeah, that's essentially the same process. I'm basically just using my uh, thumb as a point to uh, use some leverage against the the miniature to kind of help carve it down. But key key lesson here is I know where to stop. So unless you feel super comfortable with your knife, I would recommend don't try that. Um, and I'll show you where the emery boards come into play. This plastic is not super receptive to it. It's a bit soft. Uh, a lot of GW's plastic, Games Workshop, uh, a lot of their plastic is is kind of harder, so it'll it'll sand a bit better. But this is all right. All right, that's uh, almost shaved down enough. It's all about that, you know, fitting and and trimming and fitting and trimming until you get it to work just right. I think after this is done, I'll show you guys how to sculpt a bit with the epoxy putty. All right. Sometimes things are not going to fit the way you thought they would. But the key here is not to get dissuaded by that, and instead find a way to use it to your advantage. For example, this trimming is not going exactly as I planned it to, but am I going to let that stop me? Most likely not. Maybe. We'll see how it goes. <laughs> no, I won't. I'll find a way to use it. And the best part is, if you mess up a miniature, congrats, you've got new basing material. You can make it look like someone just got very unfortunate with where they ended up. Alright, so that fit works pretty well. Um, I had to cut into the torso a little bit deeper than I thought I would have to, but hey. I got it to fit. So, let's see. So I used Rune Wars as the base for this, um, but there should there's a ton of other ga a cool games you can do. So if you're wanting to kit bash some stuff and you don't want to pay super expensive prices, because a lot of a lot of the the, the real like model maker stuff, you know, like the real model kits, they can they can get expensive. If you don't want to pay that price just yet, find a cool board game that has a, some cool miniatures in it that you like. And generally, you can get that for pretty cheap, and sometimes you'll get some pretty, you'll get, most of the time, you'll get some decent miniatures out of it. And you, you won't feel as bad with them, messing them up, or just taking risks with them. I don't think I mess any, I don't think I mess really any miniature up. Um, it just becomes a new conversion, and I just come up with a different story for it. You know, we have Maurice the Mangled here. And that establishes intrigue, like, ooh, what's Maurice's story? You could say, well, a long time ago, Maurice did not pay attention to the safety signs in the butcher and got caught in a machine and then just ended up in a skeleton army. 
and that's it. So, this is not on the list, but if you work with super glue a lot, I highly recommend it. This is what's called a, a, a kicker, is the general term for it. Uh, a catalyst is what its official term is. And basically, it's a chemical that is made to, when you spray it on super glue, it will cause it to set extremely fast. And it's pretty handy. The only other chemical that I'd also recommend investing in if you want to keep using super glue is a super glue debonder. It's useful for plastic, it's more for skin. I have glued my fingers together. I have known people who have done a lot more than just glue their fingers together. They glued the phone to their head. Which I didn't believe at first. But it actually happened. Alright, so we have Maurice the Mangled here. He actually didn't turn out that mangled. I might not I might I might name him Maurice the Not So Mangled. Yeah, Maurice the Not So Mangled. So turned out pretty well. Turned out pretty well. And there's some gaps in here. Um So I'm gonna use Maurice as a good example of how you can use epoxy sculpt to further refine your figurines. All right. Most important step about epoxy sculpt, read the instructions first. It'll tell you exactly what you need to do to use it and exactly what you need to do to have safety around it and exactly what you need to do protection-wise. Most, most of these can be handled by hand. They're pretty sticky, but they don't really pose a threat. So unless you're allergic to it, you should be all right. So with this, let's open up the instructions and see here. Use in a well-ventilated area. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Safety is important. So I'm just going to go ahead and take my knife here. And this stuff sets apparently pretty fast. So, in that case, see this is, um, it's like a cow tail, but don't eat it. Uh, so this stuff... I just cut off a little little piece of it. I'm going to remove the foil on the end of it. If it will let me, please let me. Thank you. Um, and then take off this plastic. Okay, I think that's it. And what we're going to do here is we're just going to knead it together until it's a uniform color. And the ways you go about doing this, there is a large variety of ways you can do it. My favorite way is doing it with my fingers, just kind of squeezing it together. Mixing it up like it's some used gum you found under your seat in elementary school. Don't put it in your mouth like I used to do with the huge gum I found. And no, actually, I wouldn't put it in my mouth. No, that's that's what I get my friends to do. I tell them it's it's you know I'd flatten it out into a normal shape and go here. You want some gum? Yeah, that's why I didn't have many friends in elementary school. <laughs> Man, I'm just spinning up tales of like I'm making myself out to be like this horrible like kid. I wasn't. I was like the the history nerd who sat in the corner and was like, yeah, I I, I read about history. I wasn't this like malicious person I'm making myself out to be. Maybe I've been maybe I've been inhaling these chemicals for far too long. All right, so generally with most epoxies, this sets extremely fast. So I'm gonna I'm gonna let it sit for a minute or two before I sculpt it because generally when you mix up epoxies, especially two part epoxies for sculpting, it's very sticky. And if you let it sit a bit, you can actually get the stickiness to die down a bit, and you can actually make yourself uh, make it easier time to get. Um, your, your detail to hold and not stick to your tools. So, we're going to go ahead and use it because this cures in 10 minutes. So, find the gaps on your figure and just, you can press the epoxy into these gaps. And right now it's going to want to stick to your fingers. But, you know what? Don't let it. So, 
you can use a whole bunch of different sculpting tools. I generally do, but sometimes you can't beat just the random things you find. Because sometimes a fork is like the exact tool you need. Or, in this case, an X-Acto knife is the exact tool you need. Yeah, so this is still a little bit too sticky. I'll let this sit for a bit. Um, but I am going to work a bit with what I have on where I was. Yeah. So generally, you're going to let this sit for a minute. A literal minute in this case, because this sets in 10. And don't feel bad if you, you know, get a result you're not super happy with. If it doesn't look the cleanest, the glory of epoxy sculpt, most epoxy sculpts are sandable and actually kind of carve pretty well. They're meant to be used in such a manner that once you apply it on and it, it seals the gap that you want it to seal, you can come back and finish it out and make it look good. Um, not necessarily a finishing putty per se, but definitely a medium which was meant to be refined further. Uh, but for a skeleton army or a, a miniature, you can hide it in different ways. I use this stuff to sculpt fur all the time. I use it to to make chain mail, which is very easy to do. I just can you kind of poke it a bit. So I'm gonna make it look like he's gonna have some kind of rough looking chain mail. And that's gonna be the cover up secret for him. The fact of he is a figure made of joint materials. Now, I would do it on this other side. I am going to do it on this other side. So, see, no gap. It looks pretty nice, blended into a figure. If I hold it from down here, you can barely see it. This side, that's what it looked like before. So, same procedure. Take a little ball. It's very small stuff. If it gets get if this stuff gets on your hands, no problem. It's just sticky. Um, all you gotta do is wash your hands after. Just put it up into the hole to patch it. Sometimes you gotta pack it in. If you compact it down, you can make it. You know, you can get rid of the excess that you don't need. can smooth out the stuff you do. And sometimes if you get into areas like this, it doesn't have to be like a finished quality piece. It just has to look, it just has to blend in. So as long as it blends in, don't worry too much about quality. You can always hide it with rust or battle damage. So Maurice here is done. Maurice the now not so mangled. So let's see. I'm going to give old forearms here. I'm going to give him a fur collar. That's what I'll do. I'll give him a fur collar. And now that this is starting to cure, it's starting to set up a bit, it's a little bit more hard, which means it's better for, for sculpting uh, some finer detail stuff and won't be as sticky. So usually what I do for furs and stuff is I'll roll out a little length and I'll kind of mm, smush it in between my fingers. And it comes up with this irregular shape, which is good. That's what you want for furs, because fur is a natural material. It's not going to have a regular shape, even if it is cut to length uh, and cut in a specific pattern. But some of the stuff that I'm going for is kind of wild and unkempt. So I'm going to take it, I'm going to cut off the bits here that I don't necessarily want. All right, and that leaves a pretty good shape for us, pretty good base. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take it, go above his shoulder guards, round his head, and put the other end above his shoulder guards and start kind of pressing it down. And I'll adjust this so you can see uh, momentarily getting it in 
place. You can kind of look and see. You can kind of... This stuff is very, very sticky. Milliput is not as sticky as this is. So this stuff you may need, to, because it's a, a fast curing epoxy putty, you may need to let this sit for a bit longer. Closer to the 10, closer to the 2 to 3 minute mark, maybe. Um, but when you get it, if you, if, you've, if you cut it in the way that I did, you get these really nice uh, points. And it, get, it looks like folded fabric. Now we're going to take that and move it from folded fabric to fur. So all you got to do for that is start kind of making very irregular shapes. You can use all sorts of... You can use all sorts of different ways to do this, but I think the best thing to remember when sculpting fur is to remember, get the edges. Very rarely is, is fur nice and rounded on the edges. It's generally very wild because, you know, it's, it's, it's the fur of an animal. So it'll look very much more real. It'll take your, it'll take your sculpting a whole lot further if you kind of uneven the edges a bit. And make sure, be, be brave with it. Rip it up a bit. Especially if you're going for like what I'm going for, like an undead thing. Rip it up. These things aren't going to be well kept. This isn't a mink coat. This is some wild, undead animal they found. They found roadkill, and they were like, you know what? I needed a new cloak. Bring me my knife. You know what? Forget the knife. I'll just wear it right now. I'm dead anyway. I don't really care how I smell. And this stuff is really nice because how fast it's setting up, I'm able to get these really fine hair details in there. And if you get these burrs on there, it's actually not bad because uh, these little things makes it look like matted up fur. I think another key point to remember when you're sculpting anything, especially like fabric and stuff, don't keep it uniform, but keep it consistent. Because then that way it doesn't look like you just slap dash it together. All right, yeah. And in about three or four minutes, you got a pretty good looking fur cape. So this stuff right now is beyond usable, which don't mix up quite as much as I did. I thought I would have a little bit more working time with it. Generally, this stuff sets up, and this stuff is 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 and when you feel it setting up, it's it's a bit warm. Um, it's it's a partial exothermic reaction, is what that's called. Um, basically, it's the the chemicals setting so fast that it's uh, vibrating their molecular structure in such a way that I think it's it generates heat. Um, it's just a byproduct of uh, chemicals interacting with each other. So, it, it shouldn't have any harm to you. But, this is a quick setting one. It sets in about 10 minutes. Um, Milliput, you've got about 4 hours before it starts to hard, like, completely. So, generally, what you'll do is you'll leave it out for an hour to set up when you first mix it. And you've got 3 hours work time with it. And then at twenty in in eight to twenty four is eight to twelve it's completely hard, completely hard. This is just super super stiff right now. Cannot use it. So if you're going for something quick and easy, this is just a superb way. That is a it's a fantastic cloak. I it turned out a whole lot better than I thought it was, which is the best thing about kit bashing is when things turn out better than you think they do. So now you have cloaks, you have you have a, a fur tutorial, you have a kit bashing tutorial on uh, how to trim down things and and how to how to fill gaps, and I think what I should do now 
is I should finish out some more of these characters and just kind of give you some more, give you some more thoughts. All right, so we're going to use. I'm going to. I'm going to show you um, a different model I'm now. This is the millipet I was talking about. Millipet. It's a little different from this stuff. This stuff comes in a self-contained uh, kind of tube, and it's already appropriately portioned and mixed out. Millipet comes in two. Um, it comes in two bags. Uh, one. They, they kind of look unfavorable when you leave them out in the air, but usually that's. You, this, these are still good. They keep for they keep for years. So you cut equal amounts of this of each part. Um, close it, and it's the same premise as before. Just mix the two parts until they're consistent with each other. I like using Millipit a whole lot better. It's water soluble. It's longer work time. Just as just as sticky, but is generally a very pleasant material to work with. The other, the other stuff was the Gorilla Epoxy was nice too, um, but just just from a personal experience, I've always used Millipit. Uh, I haven't used Green Stuff. Green Stuff is another super popular one, especially in Warhammer. Um, it's it dries almost in like a jade color. It's very waxy looking. It's very nice to look at. This stuff dries in kind of a yellowish brown color. Like a Dijon mustard. Go to an art school. Gotta use the fancy terms. It's Dijon yellow. That's right. Not. Actually, this is this is like boiled egg. This is like hard boiled egg yolk color. That's what this is. Alright. So that's pretty that's pretty mixed up. And we're gonna let that sit for a bit. Your hands will look really fun after this. Um we're gonna take a look at our model here. See, is it Susan that needs some some adjustment or is it Eduardo? I feel like Eduardo's doesn't quite fit the skill the undead vampire skeleton necromancer aesthetic that I'm going for. Quite yet. So maybe, maybe. Hmm. Let's, let's look at Skeletor here. Does our meme lord need anything? Our meme lord needs a, a good cape. That's what we need. Gotta love that zoomer humor. All right. So same premise as before. We're gonna give uh, we're gonna give our skeleton lord here. Uh, we're gonna give him a a, a a fur trim on his cape. Actually, yeah, yeah, we're gonna give him a fur trim on his cape. Cause skeletons get cold, you know. All that bone gets. Cold. Right. I'm gonna let this stuff sit a bit more. It's still too, still too sticky to work with right now. <laughs> Now, now is when you take a break. Make sure not to put the, your fingers in your mouth after using this stuff. It's not fun. Tastes bad and makes little goblins in the corner start speaking ill of you. <clears throat> and when you try to argue back, they're like, no. We are wrong. We're wrong. And you're like, you're a figment of my imagination. It's <sighs> the best part about this you can be as nutty as you want because then people go wow you're absolutely crazy but you make cool things right oh the joys of being artistic <laughs> kind of want to make a, 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 a what would be really cool is to make like a headless horseman character so we're gonna do that now where is that sword 
Here he is. All right, we're gonna make a headless horseman character. Sometimes you can use super glue as a gap filler. I don't recommend it just because it uses a lot of super glue, but sometimes it just works. Also, I've, I've started to invest in wearing an apron while I work because I noticed that all my shorts were like getting ruined from like my paint. So, in, in sake of my for, for the sake of my um, fashion, I, I, I chose to start wearing an apron, which sounds kind of strange at first, but then it's actually kind of cool. When, in practice, because now I get an apron. Now I look official. All right. Fun fact: the kicker smells a little bit like Fruit Loops. So, if you were ever curious about that. All right. So, I think what we're gonna do is we're gonna give our headless horseman here. I'm going to set this in. He has a head, or had a head at one point. We might make him a little neck, but he will have no head. When, when you first start doing this, you, you kind of have, like, doubts about, oh, will, will this turn out okay, or will this, you know, look right, or it's not looking exactly like how I thought. And those are okay critiques to have of yourself, but sometimes you don't need to be, you know, that hard. No one's expecting you to do it perfectly the first time. Unless you're me, then you have super high expectations of of your end result. But, you know, this is this is miniatures. You're, you're making fantasy stuff. You gotta remember that. So, it's perfectly acceptable to have a little whimsy in your in your building process. As a matter of fact, it's, it's rather beneficial to have that. Sometimes realistic fantasy is not super fun. Alright. So, guys, is for kind of it's for cape kind of outlines. So now we're gonna make a little ball here. I'm gonna put it here, and then we're going to take the edge of our sanding twig, and make a little indentation. That indentation right now kind of looks a little strange, but a little bit of extra work. And a little bit of detail added in. If you want to make fabric, all you got to do is just take your exacto. Just carefully put some fold lines in. A little bit more. A little bit more around. And kind of make sure to 
put some detail in to define you know where the cape begins and where the 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 kind of the collar ends is we can delete, you can dif you can differentiate the two with with the paint as well but right now we're, we're sometimes you'll get lost in when you're sculpting that's not good all right and there we have sort of an empty collar it's kind of kind of kind of simple right now but with the right effect and right painting you can you can make that look really really cool I don't want to put a skull because I felt that was you know I like the I like the idea of a of an ethereal rider with with no head so that's what it, that's what I did all right check for fit and and see does a sword fit for yeah a sword fits um Ooh, wait, does a sword fit or does an axe fit? I feel like an, a good axe would be good. Yeah, because he's a he's a ho he's a headless horseman. So why wouldn't he have an axe? We'll just do a weapon swap. So I've cut this I've cut this axe right here off of a skeleton warrior from the kit. And I'm going to take I'm going to cut the sword off at the hilt where it makes the hand. I'm going to cut the bottom part off too. Because I have plans on extending this uh, axe handle down a bit by using the back half of uh, one of these spears. Make kind of an extended handle. Like he's holding a, a longer uh, war axe rather than just a simple hand axe. So. We're gonna take this and be wary of how you're holding it too when you hold a a, a piece that you just sculpted uh, something on. And you're gonna take it, the axe head in his hand here. Make sure to ensure that this lines up correctly. Sand it if you need to, or trim it with the X-Acto knife, or, or do as you need to. Just be, just be, just be cognizant of how it fits, because you don't want to get it all glued in and have it set, and then go, wait a minute, why is his axe like thirty degrees to the left? That's super unrealistic. You know, my headless horseman needs to have some realism, right? Okay, and that's not the greatest bond, but it works. So you feel super unsure about it. Just put a little, like the tiniest, tiniest, tiniest drip of super glue on the exterior. Again, kicker doesn't really do anything against the uh, against the milliput. And down here, piece of his hand. And then we add. The rest of the handle. It's not as thick as the actual axe handle, but I figured that maybe he had the part closer to the head of the axe um, wrapped. Maybe so it can make chopping off heads a bit more comfortable for him. You kind of look at it from all angles, hold it, make sure it fits the way you want it to fit. Look, make sure you didn't mess up any details. Inevitably, you did when you touched the stuff. You you told the people not to touch just a few seconds ago. Joys of teaching. But again, it's very very easy to fix this stuff. Getting. Ghostly commands. It's almost like when uh, in Hamlet, when when his dad came back from the dead, it was like, "Find the person who murdered me." By the way, it was totally your uncle. Spoiler for Hamlet. Although, like, if you don't know how Hamlet ends, like, you're like a hundred something. You're like at least a couple hundred years too late. So, don't feel bad. It's 
speaking of literary stuff, it's a very good place to get inspiration for for minis. Not just not just uh, images or whatever or concepts, but just characters, settings, paint schemes even. One of my favorite things to get when a movie or a video game comes out is to get the art book for that game or movie. Because usually that has all the stuff that the designers did. It either didn't, did or didn't make it in the movie, or did in some way. And it wasn't initially what the designers had intended. And it gives you kind of an insight into, you know, some really interesting design elements, how people design characters and stuff like that. Alright, so now we have him situated on his horse. Got his collar sculpted. Just a little bit of touch-up work, because inevitably I touched his, hand, I touched his cloak. His fur stuff. Can't have our headless horseman looking bad, right? Alright. So... Pretty simple, not not super complex, but pretty pretty unique and very striking profile. Might mm. add stuff to his horse later on, but that is something that I will do off camera. So push all this stuff to the side, and at the end of the day, we have some very interesting miniatures. I hope that what I have taught you today is going to help in not only inspire you to, you know, get started in this really, really awesome hobby, but also give you some confidence. Because if, you know, I can, I can sit here and, and, and ramble to an invisible audience and come up with some wild characters, then I'm sure you can just as easily do the same. Um, if you, if you want to, feel free to, like, replicate any of the stuff that I made today. Uh, I, although I do encourage you, take, take some, take some time. Look at the parts you have. I mean, no conversion is, is too wild. If you've got an idea in your head, go for it. Um, like this guy. I mean, he's just weird. You know, I've got guys with two heads, two bodies, four arms, no head. You know, four arms and one different hand, or two arms and one hand. Uh... I have funny characters like Bob and Weave. I've got Maurice the Half Mangled, who doesn't actually look all that mangled anymore. You know, I've got Horsemen, and with a, with a with a kit like this, you've got so much to work with. You've got so much potential. You can create such a unique narrative with this stuff. And then, at the end of the day, the sky's the limit. You know, your imagination is the only thing, you know, inhibiting what you do or do not make. So. It's been very fun uh, teaching all those watching uh, that about the cool stuff, the cool hobby that I love. Um, we've got some other really cool panelists. Uh, Paul, actually, the Jolly Good Giant, he, on the opposite side, paints a lot of stuff. So once you're done kitbashing your own cool miniatures, you can go watch his pa panel on painting and then paint them all up. Aside from that, that's all I have. Uh... Again, if you want to find some really cool miniatures, Games Workshop is a very cool place to look. Um, Warhammer 40K, you can get everything from, you know, giant gladiator space marines to uh, half dead space, you know, super soldiers in uh, walking armored sarcophagi, and they have really cool deep voices, um, and they look really cool, and they sound super cool, and it's got a bunch of rich lore. Uh, other games, Warlord, War Games Atlantic, uh, Victrix has a lot of really good stuff. Uh, manufacturers of, of Rune Wars make some really nice stuff. Um, there's a bunch of other kits on Amazon that you know allow you to expand this base game and, and get some rather unique looking miniatures. Um, Reaper always has really good stuff. WizKids, a bunch of fantastic companies to go look for for, for conversions. Uh, but that's all I have for you today. <laughs>